Welcome to Christ Church in this service of worship. We're pleased to have you here with us and those of you who are worshiping with us from home, it's good to have you here as well. I'm David Hall. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. What a beautiful day to get to come together. There are three more showings of the East Brainerd Community Theater's production, The Music Man. And this week, they're going to be evenings again at 7.30 on Thursday and Friday, and then on Saturday afternoon, a matinee performance at 2.30. Tickets are $15, and you can get those at the information desk here by the sanctuary. You can stop by the church office during the week, or you can purchase those online. This is a week for baked blessings. Now, a lot of you know exactly how this works, but in case you haven't heard of this before, uh, we bake three dozen homemade cookies or brownies. We bring those to the church, and then they're delivered to uh, the mustard tree ministry, and they'll serve those as part of lunch one day this, this week. So bake your cookies, bring them by Tuesday. Uh, we always remind people, don't go to the store and just buy these, okay? They don't have to be made from scratch, but do bake them at home. I can't tell you how much people enjoy getting these. Oftentimes, they take them with them when they leave the meal. We like to keep up with our members here at Christ Church, and that's hard to do. You all have a way of moving and changing phone numbers and email addresses. Uh, if you've done any of that lately, especially your cell phone, let us know. You can email the church staff. Uh, in fact, you can go on our web page and look up the office manager. Click on that, and, and it'll set up an email for you. But let us know if any of those things have changed in your contact information. And also, if you're going to be in the hospital, let us know that so we can be praying for you and also checking on you as well. Now, we'd like you to register your attendance, if you would, today. For those of you uh, here, there's a red attendance pad on the back of the seat in front of those sitting closest to the aisle. If you would, reach up and take that out. Write in your name and contact information. Pass it down your row and back. There's a good opportunity to put in a new phone number, by the way, and circle it or a new email address and circle that, and we'll, we'll pick up on that. For those of you worshiping with us from home, just open the Christ Church app and let us know that you're worshiping with us. Thank you. Well, good morning. Welcome to Children's Moment. I'm Mary Beth Hammett, the Children's Ministry Director at Christ, and I'm so glad that you've joined me. So kids, gather around, and let's just have a little chat. I don't know about you, but have you seen people who hold a sign like this, will work for food? Yeah, me too. I've seen them out uh, when I'm running errands and that kind of thing. It always makes me want to run to McDonald's and grab them a burger or pull a snack out of my car. And that's a good thing that we want to help those who are hungry. Jesus helped those who were hungry when he was on earth. He was concerned about people's needs, about their health, and about if they were had empty stomachs or if they needed resources to make their life better. But not only was Jesus concerned about empty stomachs, he was concerned about empty hearts. He wanted people to know him, to receive God's gift of love in their life. So I have a challenge for you this week. If you see someone with a sign like this, maybe there's something that you or your family can do to help them with their empty stomach, but be sure you're sharing Jesus with others so you don't miss anybody with an empty heart. I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Let's stand to our feet and worship.
Michael Brown. I'm a member here at Christ United, and I have our passage of the day. This comes from the sixth chapter of John. It starts, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's stand again as we continue in worship this morning. And the next song that we're going to teach you all is um, Psalm 23. And I don't know about you, but as a child, I memorized the 23rd Psalm. And this is a beautiful, beautiful arrangement of his lyrics. And we know that we have a father who loves us and he walks beside us. And we think of Psalm 23. It's read at a lot of funerals, right? But this song has so much for us in living our life from day to day, the anxieties, the pressures, the stress that we carry each day, we can give it to the Lord and he will comfort us. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul every day for what we need for that day, enough strength to get through it in the good times and the bad. So just sing this with us. Think about these words and worship anew this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and he leads me on for his name, for his grace.
And all God's people said, Amen. We come into this time of worship to give our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for being a generous church to make possible so many ministries here and around the world. You may give as you exit from the sanctuary. You may give online or through the church app. Or you may give by dropping it off at the church office or mailing it in. But we give God thanks for working through us as a church giving God's love into the world. Let us bow together in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for giving us Jesus Christ, your son, 
to be our Savior, to be the Good Shepherd in our lives, to be living water, to be the living vine, to be the bread of life. And we thank you that you care about our physical needs and you care even more about our spiritual needs that you gave us your only begotten Son to be our Savior, to walk beside us in goodness and mercy each and every day of our lives. And we can lean on you and depend on you for every part of our lives. We pray that you will lead us and guide us as a church as we continue in ministry and ways of your love here and around the world to give the message that you are the bread of life. We lift up to you this day those who need you in special and particular ways, especially this week, for those who may be going through difficult times, for those who are facing upcoming surgeries, for those who need your leading and guidance in ways of vocation or in finances, that you may give them the assurance and the hope that you are with them and will carry them through. We pray that you will be with those who are grieving, who've lost loved ones in recent days and weeks, that you may give them your comfort and your peace, your strength for as they walk through their days. Lord, we pray you'll be with Pastor David today as he brings your message that you've given to him. And we pray now together the prayer you continue to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I grew up with two brothers and two sisters, so now today I have lots and lots of nieces and nephews. One of my nieces is named Tina. And she has this gift for knowing exactly when to send you an encouraging text. A few months ago, I got a text from uh, Tina one morning that started out, how is my favorite uncle on the planet? Now, that's a good start to a, to a text. And then she went on to say, I thought of you this morning. I've been praying for you today. I love you. Well, I've texted her back and thanked Tina for her text, told her her timing was perfect. I needed to hear her text. And I ended it by saying, love you too. In a nanosecond, I got a reply back from her that says, what is this love you thing? Is the I button broken on your phone? <laughs> she says, I like my love personalized. So I corrected my earlier text and said, Tina, I love you too. <laughs> uh, she is an awesome Christian witness. She speaks to a lot of women's groups. She has this Facebook thing called the Stillwaters Ministry. She has a huge following in that. And whenever she makes a post, she will always start by talking about something just in everyday life. One morning she, on her post, I read it, says, you know, this morning I was, uh, was preparing breakfast for Jerry and I burned the toast. And then she says, that got me to thinking, T-H-I-N-K-I-N apostrophe. Uh, sometimes when I see that, I want to text her and say, Tina, is the G button broken on your phone? <laughs> but that's her lead-in. It's her transition from whatever story she's been telling to the deeper point of her text and her message for today. Now, along that same line, uh, I kind of hang on to that thought. I was in a director's meeting here at the church a couple months ago. It was right after Community Cafe had ended in the spring, and, and we were talking about Community Cafe. You know, we had originally envisioned that ministry as something where we would invite all of East Brainerd who wanted to come in on Wednesday night for a free meal. We would uh, enjoy that together uh, sitting around tables. Well, COVID hit, and we had to change it to a drive-through meal-to-go thing, and it was successful. And we served hundreds of people every Wednesday night. Some of them were members of our church, and you thanked us for the convenience of being able to get that meal. 
a number of them were guests that we didn't know, and sometimes we could tell they were having trouble having food in their home. We wanted to connect with them, and so we, we welcomed them as best we could. We greeted them, but it really was, you know, you just didn't have much of a chance to connect with them. So in our director's meeting, uh, we were struggling with what to do this fall, assuming COVID allows us to do that. Someone uh, expressed that, you know, some of our guests may not feel comfortable coming in and eating with us in the commons. And I totally get that. I totally understand. But I, I said, you know, there's, um, I really hope that instead of having a to-go meal drive through thing, I hope all our meals are served in the commons and we market this, we communicate it in a way that people feel comfortable coming in and sitting at tables and eating with us and hanging around afterwards and, and maybe even going to a small group or a class if they feel comfortable doing that. Uh, I was concerned that handing out meals was only a part of the ministry that we had envisioned and God had planned for us in Community Cafe. Now our senior pastor, Nathan Malone, was sitting quietly listening to our discussion. And at this point, he spoke up and he said this, I think what David is saying is that we do not live by bread alone. There is more to this ministry than physical food and handing that food out. Now, Nathan had understood my point very well. He expressed it very clearly. And uh, as Tina always says, that got me to thinking. <laughs> and so my message for today is more than bread. Uh, in the scripture that we heard read earlier in the, script, in the service, Jesus had fed the 5,000 men plus the women and children who were there that day. It was a huge miracle of taking the little they had and making it be enough. And the next morning, when the crowds realized that Jesus had crossed over the Sea of Galilee and was no longer there, they jumped into boats and followed after him, chasing him. And clearly, Jesus can see that they don't get it. They don't see that this miracle is a proclamation that he is the Messiah, the Christ. They're missing it. They were just clamoring to get another golden corral, all-you-can-eat meal, right? So these people are Jewish, and so they mentioned to Jesus, you know, on the Exodus, Moses gave us, our ancestors, manna, bread to eat, as they traveled to the promised land. You know what the word, it's a Hebrew word, manna, you know what that means? The, the first morning when the children of Israel got up and this white flaky stuff was on the stems of all the plants and it was even lying on the desert floor, they said, what is it? And manna is the Hebrew word for what is it? And that's what it became known as. The book of Exodus tells us that manna tasted like wafers made with honey. It was good. Uh, and the instructions through Moses were that you can boil it, you can bake it, you can cook it any way you want, but it only lasts for one day. It's daily bread, and it was given to the children of Israel from the time they left Egypt until they were at the border of the promised land. Now Jesus is reinforcing to them that it was not Moses so much who gave them the bread, but it was God who provided for them. And upon hearing that, the people say, Sir, always give us this bread. And that sets up Jesus' response. I'm going to continue the passage. I'm at John chapter 6, and I'll be starting at verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Just as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. In the Gospel of John, on seven different occasions, Jesus says, I am, and then fills in the blanks in different ways. He had said, I am the light of the world. I'm the living vine. I'm the good shepherd. In this one, he says, I am the bread of life. We need to explore this and see what Jesus was saying to us now 
and hear. Bread has come to mean food, right? When somebody says, would you come to my house? We'll break bread together. That doesn't mean you're just going to eat bread. It means you're going to have a meal. Uh, bread has become a universal thing. Uh, in every culture, there's a favorite bread, it seems like. Here in the South, it's probably cornbread, don't you think? Uh, in Mexico, it's probably tortilla. In India, it's something called naan. I, I traveled and worked quite a bit in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia earlier. And uh, the Georgians are these warm, hospitable, friendly people who love to have you come to their home. Uh, their food is spicy. It's kind of different than their food. And one of the favorite things about their food that I liked was their bread. The way their bread is traditionally made, the baker rolls it out, cuts it into long strips, covers it with egg whites or something sticky, and tosses it inside a clay oven. And it sticks to the top and the sides of that oven, which is fired with wood. And when the bread turns golden brown, are you getting hungry? Uh, when that bread turns golden brown, the baker takes a wooden paddle and just touches it, and the bread falls onto the paddle. My Georgian hosts would smile sometimes when they saw me continuing to take out and eat their bread. One of my hosts said to me one day, you know, David, you can tell a lot about a country or its culture by its bread. And he says the Georgian culture is ancient, and over the hundreds of years, we've learned to make some pretty good bread. Our bread, our food in general, is essential for life. You know, if we don't eat regularly, we become hungry. And then if we don't eat, if we remain hungry, we get to the point where we can think of nothing else other than finding food and satisfying that need. <clears throat> you may have heard of something called Maslow's Pyramid. Um, Abraham Maslow was a Ukrainian-American psychologist who spent his lifetime studying human behavior and needs. Uh, Maslow saw this dichotomy of life as material things on one hand and spiritual on the other. And he constructed a pyramid. If you think of a pyramid, wide at the bottom, narrow at the top. And it was his way of kind of explaining our needs and our behaviors. At the very bottom of that pyramid are basic needs for survival. It's warmth, it's shelter, clothing, it's food. Until we get that, those basic needs met, we really can't think of anything else in life that becomes our focus. That's why groups like Trinity Hope, who feeds hungry school children in Haiti, gives them a meal of rice and beans every day. They teach them about Jesus Christ, but they can't really listen and learn about Christ until those little tummies are full. When our first, most basic needs are met, we move up the pyramid to the next level, and that's the level where we have the need for safety, security, health. If we lose our regular job, we can, may be living and operating at the very peak of that pyramid, but if our career is threatened or our job is lost, we go right back to that second level, and we focus on that until we feel safe again. The next level up is the need for love and a sense of belonging. One of the most important things we do in church is to help people feel loved, to help them feel part of a small group or a ministry where they are welcomed. One more level up is the need for esteem, respect, and to be affirmed. There's only one more level to the pyramid, and now this is the very peak. It's the top basic human need. And it is the need that uh, Maslow called it transcendence or self-actualization. Those are big words. And what he meant by that is this is the level of the pyramid where we become concerned about morality, right and wrong. This is the point where we recognize we need God. We need to worship God. Now, this construct is not the secret to life, but it is helpful as we do ministry and serve in the church to understand people's needs and go about meeting those needs. Uh, our daughter, Rachel, is a medical anthropologist. And if you're like me, when she came home from college and told me what she was going to major in, I said, a medical what? <laughs> well, a medical anthropologist studies the cultural effects on a person's health. They develop uh, health care uh, solutions 
that will work in that culture, and then they present them to people in that culture. Um, Rachel did her doctoral research in Guatemala, and the focus of her research was figuring out what mothers in Guatemala would, uh, what, what uh, health care solution they would accept when their little children, and their especially babies, infants, get dehydrated because of particularly diarrhea. You wouldn't believe it, but that is a leading cause of death among babies in developing countries. She learned what treatments mothers in Guatemala would accept and use with their babies, and then she returned to train them and their midwives. Now, Rachel gave birth in July 2012 to her first, her own firstborn little boy named Bryce. And when Rachel, when he was about six months old, Rachel told me, I'm headed back to Guatemala to do some training. Will you go with me and keep Bryce for me while we're there? And of course, I said, yes. Now, it was amazing to see Maslow's Pyramid at work in so many levels on that trip to Guatemala. We were in the mountains. We were going to these little villages tucked into the mountains. One day we parked our vehicle almost on a cliff overlooking a field below. Two men with these huge hoes or mattocks were turning up the soil. And what they were doing was preparing to plant maize, corn, which is a staple for them. They were meeting their family's first level, satisfying their hunger with food on the bottom of that pyramid. I put Bryce in this little carrier that Rachel had that, uh, and she and I hiked over the mountain and up into this little, uh, little settlement uh, where all these mothers had gathered together for Rachel's class. Now they had come because of their need and their desire for their babies to be healthy, the second level on the pyramid. Um, as I listened outside in the yard of what was going on inside, I could hear Rachel speaking in Spanish and her translator hearing in Spanish and speaking in Quechicale. Now, Quechicale is the native language of those Guatemalan mothers. And there was something about hearing their native language that made them feel accepted and affirmed and comfortable. They could understand perfectly what was being said. But I also noticed that these, see, that's the third level of the pyramid. But I also noticed these young mothers were having a blast. <laughs> they, were, they were drinking hot tea and eating cookies. And see, they're at the fourth level. They're being, uh, they're being affirmed. They're being loved. They're being, uh, they're being shown respect. God is already in Guatemala. But there is something about having those needs met as we go up the pyramid that put us in a position to listen more closely, to deepen our relationship with God, sometimes to hear God speak for the first time. When the church does its work in mission, we oftentimes target a particular level of that pyramid without even acknowledging it or thinking about it. We pick a level, a need that we're satisfying. Sometimes we satisfy needs at multiple levels, levels as we do mission work, as I saw happen that day or that week in Guatemala. We always need to remember that whenever we serve, we should name the name of Jesus Christ. That helps us get right to that peak because it's not just us who build a habitat house or feed children or, or serve at the Bethlehem Center. It is God who sends us. We need to hear what Jesus is really, really saying to us in this passage. I am the bread of life. Come to me and be fed. I remember visiting one evening in Mountain Shadows in the home of a business executive whose family was worshiping here at Christ Church. As I drove up, I saw the driveway had a number of beautiful, expensive cars, and there was a huge boat sitting in the garage. The door was up. This man had moved up the corporate ladder, and now he was the head of his company, he had, was very, very successful. He talked to me some about his success in life. And then he turned to me and said this, is this all there is to life? That is the saddest question a person can ask. 
But the answer is really good news. No, it is not. Um, he had eaten well of the, of the bread of, of success, of material things. He didn't have to worry about any of those things on the, on the levels as he goes up. He didn't have to think even much at all about his daily physical needs. They were provided. I was able to share with him that night that there is so much more to life than having things and material needs and, and uh, letting him know that Christ can make a huge difference in our lives. Probably the best definition I have ever heard of evangelism is this. Evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find a piece of bread. And that piece of bread is the bread of life. That's all I did that night. Sometimes we Christians get distracted by material things and possessions, and we miss out on the thing Jesus is calling us to do here. That is to believe so deeply in him and follow him so closely that we will never, ever hunger or thirst again. Let's pray every day for our daily bread and for our necessities in life. Let's do that. Let's not take them for granted. But then let's thank God for providing those and move on, remembering there is more to life than bread. Let's spend our lives seeking the bread of life, and it will be given to us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Gracious and holy God, we thank you for giving us such bountiful blessings. You provide for us. It's not always easy. And help us to always be thankful when you do provide those basic needs for us. But then help us not just to linger there, to be focused on those. Help us instead to seek after the bread that you offer that is so sweet and nourishing. This relationship that you seek to have with us. Help us not to turn away from that. Help us not to get distracted. But help us to make that the focal point of our lives. These things we lift in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. For he is the bread of life.
Would you stand for this invitation? If you're here today and would like to come and unite with the church, I would be so happy to receive you. I'll be standing here on the front row. If you want to come and accept that bread of life and profess your faith in Him, I'll help you to do that as well. For those of you worshiping at home, my phone number will be on the screen. Please reach out to me with a text or a phone call, and I'll be happy to, to discuss those with you. morning on my way to church I stopped at Starbucks 
I have this habit, and there's a young barista there who always comes to the window, he takes an order, and I've gotten to know him. His name is Caleb, and this morning he says, what are you preaching on today? And I said, well, as it turns out I am preaching. I'm preaching on more than bread. Well, what, what's your sermon? What's your uh, text? And I said, well, it's about uh, I'm the bread of life. And he goes, oh, and I'm the living water. <laughs> and then he says, tell him Caleb said that. <laughs> So I had to tell you, okay? You see, we, we don't just come to church, and that's a different part of our life. Christianity, who we are, who we worship, goes with us wherever we are. Go and be the people of Christ. Amen.